To this day, it retains its original clapboard, wooden siding, and several additions have been built over the years. A combination of stone and brick smokehouse still stands in the side yard, and there is the stone foundation of a root cellar next to the street. The cellar is overgrown with wild grapevines and bushes, and is not visible except to the person willing to crawl into the thick vegetation. People's lives have both begun and ended within its walls, and as someone who grew up in it, I can say with some certainty that the house is haunted. Regardless of whether or not ghosts exist, the fact remains that the phenomena commonly attributed to lingering spirits have occurred there. Being nearly 200 years old, it comes as no surprise that this house has had its fair shape of ghost sightings. When I was very young, I witnessed the ghost of a child in the basement. When I saw him, he started walking quickly away from me, glancing back at me every few seconds. He seemed very nervous and shy, almost as if he had been caught in a place where he shouldn't have been. I don't think he meant for me to see him. Due to my immature age, I simply thought he was just another kid and followed after him. He had disappeared around a corner and I could not find him. There were no exits from the house in the direction he had gone. I never saw him again. Although, as I grew older, I found that the basement became very uncomfortable, as if there was a presence there which wanted to be left alone. During my teenage years, I was walking across the yard adjacent to the house on my way to finish some chores. There was a new moon, and since this was not a heavily populated area, the only source of light was the stars in the night sky. I was lost in my thoughts until the black silhouette of a person seemed to jump up immediately in front of me out of nowhere. Just as suddenly it was gone. It was as if someone were playing a prank on me, jumping out, attempting to scare me. Both before and after it appeared, I could see the vague outlines of the yard illuminated by starlight, and there was nowhere to hide out there. Being deeply religious at the time, I began praying urgently and continued to do so until I was back inside, as this deeply disturbed me. Having grown up walking through the woods in pitch blackness, nothing could ever have surprised me in that way, be it a person or an animal. A few years later, I was in my bedroom on the second floor of the house. It was around midnight. Suddenly, I felt two presences, one on either side of me. For some reason, I knew not to look at them, and I kept my gaze facing forward. Out of my peripheral vision, I could see two brown, cloud-like apparitions, one on my left and one on my right. They were about five feet tall, and only about twelve inches away from me. They seemed to be communicating with me, almost telepathically although there were no words. I was not afraid of them, because at that time in my life, I had come to terms with the idea that ghosts were in my house. They seemed to be checking up on me, as if making sure I was doing okay. A few moments later, they were no longer visible, but I felt the same presence for another ten minutes or so. Shortly after this, I witnessed a framed picture flying violently off the wall and crashing to the floor. I was into practicing occult rituals at the time, and this happened during one of my private ceremonies. During another ceremony, I heard the disembodied sound of someone whistling, truly fuel for nightmares. Some of my family members had experiences of their own as well. My mother slept on the ground floor, and she has heard footsteps walking across the creaky floorboards while in the kitchen, and up and down the stairs when no one else was in the house. When one of my siblings was very young, he reported a dark-haired girl with a nose ring sleeping in the backyard. The posture he described her in was that of a corpse, 
lying flat on her back with her arms crossed over her chest. I personally went out to see where she was lying, and nobody was there. I've often wondered who she was, since everyone in the area knew each other, and nobody matched this description. Another one of my siblings once reported seeing a glowing golden boy who looked exactly like me, like a doppelganger, except for the golden color. He was seen crawling on all fours next to my sibling's bed. Although this was most likely a dream, it is interesting since my sibling was clearly shaken by the experience and lost sleep for several nights because of it. Our neighbors nearby once told us that they had seen what they described as red demon eyes dancing in one of the cornfields next to our house. This sighting apparently terrified them, and the children living in that house had night terrors for weeks afterward. Another set of neighbors reported that their children heard the sounds of a woman screaming in the woods, and to this day I honestly hope that it wasn't any living person, because based on their description of the sound, it would be better if it was a ghost, or even some sort of animal. It has been years now since I moved away from that area. However, I still think of the experiences I had there. I have learned that I am sensitive to paranormal activities, and whenever I am looking for a new house or apartment, I always take the time to stop and try to sense if anything paranormal is going on there. Yeah, this is an interesting little story from Alana in Wisconsin. Special Gifts A few years ago, my dear friend's late husband passed away tragically. He was a lover of all things Lego and Lego-related. The outbuilding on their property housed every type of size, shape, color, and package of Lego you could ever dream of. A few months after his passing, I started noticing Legos would randomly appear in places. Within a couple of days of me finding a Lego, my friend, his widow, would contact me that she found a feather. Its shape and color specific to the one that we both shared a love of. We knew it was quote-unquote ours, as we affectionately called him, letting us know that he was around. One day after work, I walked out to my car in the parking lot, and in the middle of the trunk of my car was a bright green Lego. About a week later, same thing. Coming out of work, a bright blue Lego was on the ground right as I stepped onto my driver's side door to get into the car. I just smiled and looked up and said, Thanks, R. We all miss you and love you so very much. For now, the Legos and feather sightings have stopped. Although, one side note, before I was going to send this story, I went to let my dog outside, and there on my patio table, what do you suppose I found? A bright red Lego. I know for a fact this Lego was not there this morning when I let the dog out, nor when I went outside to water the flowers. I washed off that exact table. I think that's R's way of letting me know he approves of sharing this heartwarming story. We know in our hearts R is resting in peace and building those great Lego sets. Hi Lex. Um, my name is Annie. I'm from Northern California. Um, I want to first say that I really like your show. My husband and I listen to it often, and um, thank you for doing what you do. Um, I am a nurse's aide, which is, if you don't know, I work at the hospital, and I used to work at skilled nursing facilities, um, sort of just helping the nurse and helping patients and residents um, bathe and go to the bathroom and get dressed and stuff like that. And for a long time, I worked at a skilled nursing facility. So when I had first started working there, I worked on the oldest part of the building. It's sort of the furthest from the office. And um, there was one day that I was, I was working, it was in the, I worked the swing shift. So 
usually if something crazy was going to happen, it would usually happen on my shift because a lot of people get more confused at night and stuff like that. And there was a patient or resident uh, there who was having a particularly bad evening. She was, I think they like had changed her medication or something. So she was seeing things and unhappy and she kept calling and kind of telling us these wild stories of things she'd seen in her room. And one of the things had been that she said that in the middle bed, so she was in the, the first bed um, in her room and she was sort of bed bound. She didn't really leave her room. If she did, she was in a wheelchair, but the middle bed, the B bed was empty. And she, one of the things she'd said was, oh, there's a, there's a woman under that bed. But she was also talking about like someone in a bear suit and a little boy coming in a room, and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, it wasn't particularly creepy to anyone. And honestly, I sort of forgot about it. And I worked there for years. And during the time that I worked there, they did like renovations. And for a while, they closed that wing down and supposedly, you know, fixed some stuff or whatever. And all those residents were moved to another wing of the of the facility and during that time I sort of moved around too and I started working in the the front by the office that was sort of the rehab so I, I'm not certain exactly how many years later probably like six I got like floated over to that unit um, at the time that room the specific room um, it was just opening up and they had just put in a B bed. There hadn't been a middle bed for a while. They just, they had had a, an A and a C, but no B. There was only one resident in that room. She was a confused lady. She was cute. Um, and I was working, I was walking down the hallway and she was kind of trying to close the door. And, you know, she was a, a fall risk. She could get up and fall out of her wheelchair. So I was like, you know, so it's okay, ma'am. Let's leave the door open. You know, I don't want you to you know, need help and not be able to, you know, have us not be able to hear you. And she looked at me and she's like, I'm not by myself. There's that woman right there under the bed. And I just instantly remembered that little, that night, that interaction I'd had that I totally forgotten about. And I was like, oh, it's so spooky. So I, I kind of was talking to one of the other girls about it later. She and I kind of like spooky stuff and a couple nights later, or the next week or something, I was leaving and I was walking to my bike and that girl I had been talking to and another girl were walking out together talking and the other girl um, was like, Annie, hey, did you hear the creepy thing that happened in, in room 16? And I was like, uh, yeah, Are you talking about the lady under the bed? I was the one who was there. I saw that. And she's like, no, the thing that happened tonight. So apparently what they said happened was um, they finally moved a, a, a patient, a resident, a person into that B bed and, and she couldn't see or not well anyway. And she didn't have like great use of her lower extremities. And so I guess um, they were helping her get in her pajamas or whatever. And they were helping her in the bed and her leg kind of went off the side of the bed, I guess. And they're like, okay, pick, try to pick your leg up. And she, was like, well, I would, but the woman under the bed won't let go of my leg. I just thought that was especially creepy because there was three different, different things that happened. Same bed, same story. I'm not making any of this up. I just thought it was a cool story. So anyway, um, thank you for listening and um, take care. If you're a fan of Anything Ghost and you're enjoying the 10 free episodes that are available to you, then you should look into getting the complete archive of Anything Ghost. It's 12 years of Anything Ghost, and it's available to the VIP group members only. There's a one-time membership fee, and you'll become a lifetime member of Anything Ghost VIP group. So go to anythingghost.com, and then go to the Join the VIP Group tab, www.anythingghost.com, Join the VIP Group. And it makes a great Halloween gift, Charlie Brown. A story from Max in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hooded Shadow Figure When I was a kid, I lived in a row home 
in the area of Harrogate in North Philadelphia. One day, me and my older brother changed the layout of our rectangular room while we cleaned around. My bed was placed diagonal from the door entrance at the opposite corner. My brother's bed was placed parallel to mine, but on the other corner was across from the door entrance. The night I tried to sleep, I turned over on my right side, facing the open door. The room was dark, but there was a dim light bleeding in from the hallway because my parents were awake and their lights were turned on. In the moment after I turned over, I saw something that was not normal. I saw the head and the hand of a hooded shadow figure creeping out very slowly from behind the door. It had a long nose and long fingers. I immediately jumped off of my bed and ran to my parents' bedroom and told them what had happened. My parents grabbed their holy oil and drew a cross on the door with the oil and began to pray. They were there for a while and nothing abnormal happened again. My brother went back to bed after the commotion, and I was unable to sleep peacefully, uninterrupted. Ever since that night, I have tried to make sense of the incident. I know for sure I would hang jackets and hoodies behind the door. However, the long nose and the long fingers were very prominent. Luckily, since that night, I never saw anything abnormal again. However, this incident was my second paranormal experience in that house and Max sent along an illustration he made of the shadow figure that he saw, and I'll post that along with this story on anythingghost.com. Next story is from Jeff in Plano, Texas. EVP. I have recently started a small paranormal group in North Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area. I started going out two years ago to various cemeteries, and see what I could find. Never really had much luck, until now. The first place we visited was the Ross Cemetery in McKinney, Texas. It's an offshoot of the Pecan Grove Cemetery. Mainly, a lot of slaves were buried there. We didn't know too much about it, except that it's kind of overgrown and not kept up well. As we were walking around, we found a headstone that read, Hana Ross. Was she one of the first to be buried there? As we were recording audio, my friend asked if the cemetery was made because of Hannah Ross. After reviewing the recording, we heard what sounded like, Please leave. Next time, we had a bigger group. It was July 13th, Friday the 13th, of 2008, at Old Alton Bridge in Copper Canyon, Texas. This area had been a local hotspot for people to come. It has an old bridge that is not in use anymore, surrounded by woods and a trail. As my group and I were walking around, we all gathered in a clearing in the woods. We all felt a little strange. We hadn't been recording audio or video for about five minutes, when the video recorder was completely drained of battery. Other people have gone there and recorded have gotten an EVP with the name Steve, but there is no record of anyone named Steve that we could find. Well, about that time we also caught an EVP and it said the name Steve, but we didn't hear it until we got back. As we geared up with the fresh video battery, one of the women asked aloud, were you involved with the killing of Oscar? Oscar Washburn was the name of a goat farmer who was murdered by the KKK in the area and on the voice recorder, we captured what I could only describe as something non-human responding to that question. We couldn't figure out what the response was, but having learned some time ago that sometimes you listen to the EVP backwards and it makes sense, I suggested that, and what we heard was, have you heard of me? A story from Sharon in Australia. Go to your mother, she's crying. I was very close to my grandparents as a child. My grandfather was a wonderful man, a loving, caring granddad. When I was ten, he had a routine gallbladder operation. 
To our family's dismay, he passed away afterwards due to complications from the surgery. I remember the shock and deep sadness and how incredibly sad my beloved grandmother was. Her tears were harder to bear than anyone else's. My grandmother and auntie came to stay with us until they found a new home closer to ours. One night, soon after the funeral, I was asleep on a mattress on the floor of my bedroom. My grandmother was on my bed. My mother, coming into the room, woke me. She sat on grandmother's bed, comforting her in grief. I don't know what made me look out the bedroom door. However, I did, and there he was, dressed as if he was going to town with his hat and his button-down shirt. He looked at me, smiled, and waved. Then he turned and walked down the corridor, just like he was really there. Nothing ghost-like about him. Naturally, only being ten years old, I was terrified. I flipped back onto my stomach and buried my face in the pillow. I remember shaking and my heart pounding. It took me a long time to recognize the specialness of his visit. And it wasn't until I was an adult before I could talk about it. For fifteen years, I told no one. One day, years later, I was talking to my mother about it, wondering if she would believe me or dismiss it as childhood grief. To my surprise, she smiled and told me that he had come to her room that night as well. He sat on the side of her bed and said to her, Go to your mother. She's crying. Hi, Lex. Uh, my name is Sammy. I am from Missouri, but I currently actually live in Florida. So the first story is about my grandfather on my dad's side. He passed away when I was about two years old. Um, so this story kind of connects to, um, we'll just call her my aunt because she is, but she's not. I was going through a bit of a dark phase in my life, and um, I was drinking and smoking and, you know, just not doing the, making the best of choices. And I had a school assignment, and we had to get a letter from a family member. Could be anyone we wanted to get a letter from. Well, I went and I was talking to my aunt about the school assignment. She said that she already had a letter written out for me. And in my head, you know, I'm kind of like, oh, well, I didn't really choose who I was going to get it from yet. You know, how could you already have one written out? Well, then she kind of pauses for a second. She said, it's from your grandfather. I was like, well, what do you mean it's from my grandfather? She says, well, he came to me in a dream and told me that you had this school assignment. And he told me what he wanted to say to you. And when I woke up, I typed it out. And in my head, of course, I'm thinking, that's not possible. Um, I guess part of me really just did want to believe that it actually did come from him after actually reading the letter. It kind of sounded like maybe, you know, maybe these are the things that he, he would say. So I believed it and I put it in my school assignment. Well, I'd say by the time I hit ninth grade, she had eventually written out two more letters to me. And this is when I got a little further down that bad choice road and she wrote me a second letter and a third letter and basically in both letters she was pretending to be him from what I know saying you know like I can't believe you're drinking I can't believe you're smoking why would you do this to yourself you're throwing your life away um completely opposite of the way the first letter was you know the first letter he told me how he was proud of me and you know just all the good things and so Eventually, I confronted her because I was, I was really upset. And at this point, I didn't believe that any of the letters were real, not even the first one. Before I confronted her, by the time I got the third letter, I was, was really upset. And before I went to bed, I kind of just said out loud, you know, I was like, Grandpa, if you can talk to her, why can't you talk to me? You know, like, you go into her dreams and you say to her what you want to say to me. Why can't you come into my dreams? Come talk to me. And so went to bed. And I'd say in the middle of the night, I don't really know. I couldn't open my eyes. I woke up. And I, I don't know how, but I know that I was awake. 
and I couldn't really open my mouth. Again, I don't know why, but I know for a fact that I was awake. Like, I just, I just know this for a fact in my gut that I was awake. But I woke up, and I was laying down on my back, and I felt this cold chill kind of go over me. And as it went over me, I kind of got this, I don't want to say numb, but kind of like a numbing, tickling kind of feeling. And it was cold. You know, it was like a cold spot. It went over me. And afterwards, I opened my eyes. There wasn't, you know, there was nothing in the room. I truly felt like maybe that was my grandpa giving me a sign that he was still around. Um, Of course, later on, I confronted my aunt, and she told me that the second and third letter were not real, and she was pretending to be him, but she swears, you know, up and down forever and always that that very first letter was real. Okay, and the second story has to do with my little sister, Gabby, and I believe at this time she was probably about six years old. And so what happened was we were living in the middle of nowhere. We were living out in Winfield, Missouri. Um, A couple times in this house, I swear, I had some paranormal experiences, but, you know, I kind of always pushed it off. Uh, I was probably about 12 at the time. And I kind of just pushed it off, telling myself, you know, I'm, I'm being crazy, I'm imagining things. Well, one night my dad and I are sitting out in the living room, of course, listening to your podcast, and uh, little sister, she knows she's down the hallway, probably in her room and my dad's room, just playing around, doing whatever she is, being a kid. Well, out of nowhere, she comes running, I mean, like, bolting for her life from my dad's room at the very back of the house down this long hallway into the living room, and she just falls down to her knees, and starts screaming her head off. I mean, she is just screaming. And my dad and I are sitting there, you know, we're like, what's going on? Gabby, why are you, you know, why are you screaming? What's going on? What did you see? What happened? She won't say anything. And, I mean, when I was little, it felt like she was screaming for, like, forever. But, you know, I mean, in reality, she's probably only screaming for, like, a minute or two. When she gets done screaming, you know, and I finally say, Gabby, what happened? And she says, there's a man staring at me from daddy's window. And I walked to my dad's room and I was like, Gabby, what are you, what are you talking about? There's nobody here. She says, well, there was a man standing at the window staring at me. I said, well, I don't know where he went, but I don't see him. He's not here now. You know, he ran away. Maybe we scared him off. And then she says, no, he's over there. And she, like, points, you know, to the window, but she's kind of pointing in, like, this further back area of, like, the backyard between us and the neighbor. And I guess there was a streetlight back there, but I don't really remember there being one back there. But I do remember that when I did look back there, I saw something that looked like a streetlight. And, like, underneath the light, I saw a man standing there and, you know, kind of facing the direction of my dad's room the of the window and so you know I saw it but I I told her you know I don't see him try to get her to kind of just calm down and pretend he's not there um but in my in my mind I was I was pretty freaked out and I guess that's all I've really got for now I'll probably end up sending more stories later on I hope that this recording turns out well to play on the show um You know, even if you don't play it on the show, I still really appreciate your podcast. And I think it's really inspiring to see, you know, where you started from and how far you've come. And I believe it took you till episode 30 or so before you actually got any email stories and you just never quit. And I thought that was really inspiring. I've actually downloaded every last one of your podcasts up until the most current one as I am a VIP member. Uh, really happy about that. My fiance did it for our anniversary. But anyways, Lex, I really appreciate your podcast. I hope you like my story. I hope your listeners like my story. Um, and as always, take care. Dear Grey Pumpkin, I'm looking forward to your arrival on Halloween night. I hope you will bring me lots of presents. They're back. All the Little Peanuts characters in a happy Halloween special that's filled with delightful, heartwarming adventures from their wonderful cartoon world. 
It's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown. George! And here's Linus to tell you more about it. On Halloween night, the great pumpkin rises out of his pumpkin patch and flies through the air with his bag of toys for all the children. While Linus waits for the great pumpkin, ghosts and goblins, witches and owls make the scene with Charlie Brown and his Peanuts playmates off on a haunting spree that's filled with surprises. It's the great pumpkin, Charlie Brown, in color. There's a story from Cody in Richmond, Kentucky. Kentucky Haunting Throughout my life, I've had many paranormal experiences, and I've always been fascinated by the unknown. The following story is one that always sticks out most in my mind. I believe it was 2004. I was about 15 and was living in Paris, Kentucky. My mom came home one night and was telling the rest of the family about some weird occurrences that had been happening at her aunt's house. She said that every night, until 10 till 9, she would hear a strange whistle in her house, followed by other noises. After intense questioning from my brother and I, she told us we should just come over. That night we went over to the house, and a few other family members were there as well. We all gathered around the dining table to listen to this strange noise. My great-aunt placed a recorder in the center of the table, and explained she was going to record the noise this time so that other people could hear it and possibly find out what was making the noise. Around 8.45, we all became very quiet as my aunt turned on the recorder. After a few minutes of waiting, it happened. Out of nowhere, everyone heard the noise. The best way I can describe it is a whistle or a bird chirp. After a short discussion of to what it could have been, we decided to play back the recorder and have another listen. On the recording, after you hear the whistle, you can hear one of my family members say, What was that? And right afterward, we got a response. On the recording, we heard a male voice say, That was me. We all looked around at each other in shock as we heard the playback. After that night, my mom, my brother, and I would go over to my aunt's house almost every night. But from then on, we would all ask questions to the spirit. I remember one of my first questions being, What was your name? And when the recording played back, you could hear the man say, Marcus Allen Rutherford, in an almost whispering voice. Each night, we would go over there with new questions to ask, and every night, there would be more activity and more unexplained events. Sometimes, when playing the recordings back, we could hear the doorbell ringing and someone knocking on the door, but in real time, we would not hear those things. The last night we were over there, I decided things were getting too intense to go back. We would ask questions and get answers. But this time, there was a male and a female voice. At one point, my aunt decided to put a recorder in the kitchen, both recording at the same time. However, every time she would push the record button in the kitchen and then head back toward the dining room, the record button would pop up and stop recording in the kitchen. After a few attempts, instead of the button just popping up, the whole recorder was thrown off the kitchen counter. Back in the dining room, I was sitting in disbelief and was unsure what to make of it all. At that moment, we heard a hissing noise coming from the bathroom, followed by a loud crash. My aunt jumped up and ran to the bathroom and said that someone had sprayed the aerosol air freshener and thrown the can in the bathtub. After that night, my brother and I did not go back over there. My aunt stayed with my grandmother until she could get someone to come bless the house. 
From what I hear, she finally did get someone to bless the house, and the activity stopped. But I'll never forget the nights when I went over there and what I experienced. Here's a story from Gary in Preston, England. Mandy. In 2004, I met a beautiful woman at work. We went on a couple of dates and fell for each other very quickly. She had her own place, and one night, before I had met her family, she asked me to stay over. We were sitting on a sofa watching TV when she said she was tired and decided to go to bed. We had been watching a film with about 20 minutes left, so I said I would follow up after the film finished. About ten minutes passed, when something to the right of me caught my eye. I quickly turned to see a little girl around the age of two, with blonde curly hair, wearing a blue and white checkered dress, peeping around the corner of the living room door with a big smile on her face. It felt like she was there for five to eight seconds, but it was more like a fraction of a second, and then she just suddenly ran off. I immediately jumped up and tried to follow her, but she had disappeared. I thought to myself, it's time to go to bed. The next morning I told my girlfriend what I had seen the night before, hoping she wouldn't think I was losing my mind, and what she came back with made the hairs on my neck stand on edge. When her mom was pregnant with her, she lived across the street and about ten houses up with her dad and her two-year-old sister. In October of 1964, her sister was playing in the garden with her dad and was sucking on a lollipop. She decided to run up the stairs to the rear garden door, but she tripped and choked. An ambulance was called, but she was pronounced dead on arrival. Later that day, my girlfriend said she would like me to meet her mum, but her father had since passed. That evening, we went to her mum's house, and she was waiting for us at the door. We did all the first-time greetings in the hall, and when I walked into the living room, I was greeted by a 12 by 8 picture of the little girl I had seen the night before. And here's a story from Andrew in Texas, caretakers at the Baker Hotel. At the time of this story, I was a photojournalist in Dallas-Fort Worth at one of the TV stations. One of my favorite things to do was to shoot video essays of old buildings. I've always been drawn to classical architecture. In North Texas, there is not a lot of it. The Baker is an hour and a half west of Fort Worth in the city of Mineral Wells. While covering news stories out that way, I was always fascinated by the white elephant sitting in this small Texas town. It literally looms over the mineral wells, 14 stories tall with 450 rooms in a slight V-shape with a 35-foot tower and spooky but beautiful Spanish colonial architecture. The hotel was opened in 1929 to take advantage of the natural health craze during the part of the century, and mineral wells water with its small amount of lithium drew people from all around the world. Many guests stayed months at a time. All the A-list stars from the 1930s through the 60s stayed at the Baker. Bonnie and Clyde were said to have eaten their last steak dinner at the Baker before leaving for their final shootout in Louisiana. Like many old, abandoned buildings, there are many tales that surround them, some true, some not. The Baker is no different. I would encourage people to look it up for more info for themselves. The Baker closed for good in 1972. After contacting the property manager and asking for permission to do the video essay, I went out and was not disappointed. I interviewed some people that worked there in its heyday. The video turned out great. My goal was history and architecture not to do a ghost story. The ghost story happened a couple years later. It does seem that some old buildings lure people to them. The baker drew me in. 
I became good friends with the building manager and the locals that gave tours on the weekends. Before I knew it, I was doing tours every Saturday. This lasted for two and a half years. It was a blast taking people around the hotel. Many locals on the tours had their own stories about the hotel in its prime. Most had never been inside. It catered to the elite. I have been from top to bottom of the hotel. I never saw or heard a thing. If I did, I would have come back. There were many times I felt like there were spirits around me, but they seemed to like me. They knew I was only there to help. I can say there were times on some floors, not used for tours, that it felt like I was almost walking through a crowd. But nothing ever tried to show itself or scare me, and it would have been quite easy. It's impossible to get out of that hotel quickly from the upper floors. The only exits are an old hand crank elevator and the dangerous cramped fire stairs. During the holiday season and my final few months at the hotel, it was decided that the maintenance man and I would hang Christmas lights on the exterior of the building from top to bottom. It was quite an undertaking for two people, but we did it. I ended up on floors that I had never been before, securing lights to window frames. It was creepy, but nothing strange happened. I'm sure I muttered a few times into the air that I was just working and that I'd be done soon. The lights went up without a hitch, and the hotel looked amazing. For the first time in thirty years, the baker was lit for Christmas. Up to that point, I had not been in the hotel at night. It was different at night, to be sure. At that time, the grand lobby was still in decent shape, with the darkness and the chandeliers lit, all the dust and water damage faded away. You had the feeling, at any moment, a bell captain would tap you on the shoulder and politely offer to take your bags. I was proud of the Christmas lights, and I wanted to show them off to a girlfriend I had been dating for a couple weeks. I didn't know her that well, but I found out much more about her after a trip to the hotel. So on a cold December night, Emily and I arrived at the baker. I'll confess, I was nervous about being at the hotel at night, but as the man, I put those fears aside. As long as I had a flashlight, I would be okay. The hotel looked amazing as we got into town. You could see all the lights from miles away. I was excited to show her the place. It was going to be a good night. My fellow tour guides had the lobby lights lit early in the evening to make it easy to navigate. The breaker boxes were in a room off the lobby I did not like. I couldn't tell you why. It just felt wrong. There we were, the baker lobby at night, and the whole place to ourselves. She seemed interested, if not a little distracted. I could understand, but was I staying strong? I figured if I got nervous, she would freak out. After the lobby tour was completed, I ushered her to the original hand crank elevators, art deco doors, all headed up to the top floor for the cloud room, with windows that overlooked the city, and then on to the tower. We stepped in. I moved to my left to operate the crank. As I looked up, I noticed that she was wedged in the corner, diagonal to me, as far away as she could get. I thought this was strange. She was a good six feet from me. She looked uncomfortable, but I carried on. I have a tendency to overlook the obvious. I left the doors open, so we could see which floor we were passing each marked on the concrete wall as you went by. Floor after floor sped by. I slowed to the top floor. My friend stayed in the corner and said nothing. All the other floors were marked with numbers in white paint. Oddly, the top floor said Cloud Room in red. Trying to be funny, I said, Red Rum. I found out later she heard murder. Emily had never seen The Shining, 
She must have thought I was nuts. So there she was, 14 floors up in the dark, abandoned, hotel, with someone saying, murder. We got out of the elevator, and I showed her around the cloud room. She stuck very close to me. I could tell at that point she was freaked out, but I was determined to show her the tower which accessed that floor. After a short look around the cloud room, we headed behind the elevators to a dark hallway that led to the tower access. I thought the tower would be romantic. The air was tense at this time, and I thought she was just being nervous about this spooky building. With the flashlight lighting the way, we made the turn for the hallway to the tower. She was right behind me. About halfway to the hallway, she literally jumped on my back, nearly knocking me over. I asked her what was wrong. She said she heard something behind us. Being only steps away from the stairs to the tower, I carried on. The lower portion of the tower houses the old-fashioned original motors for the elevator and a spooky water tank in the middle. A spiral metal staircase leads up to the top of the tower. Well, we didn't quite make it. Emily stopped about halfway, only steps from our destination. I didn't press moving on. We made our way back to the elevator. Again, she pressed herself diagonally in the corner of the elevator. It seemed even stranger this time, since she was stuck to me during the entire top floor and tower. We made it back to the lobby with no problem. It was a relief to be away from the darkness of the upper floor and to have an exit in sight. Back in the light of the lobby, I could tell she was ready to get out of there. Both of us laughed a little uncomfortably. She wanted to step outside. We sat on the steps, both relieved to be in the fresh air, and I asked her if she was okay. This is what Emily told me. When we first went into the elevator, she saw three people standing in the middle. Two women and a man dressed in clothes from the 30s or 40s. They were as real as you and me. That's why she was pressed in the corner. She then told me that they were caretakers of the hotel and that they knew me and were curious about why I was there at the hotel so late at night. She told me that we were in the hallway to the tower and when she jumped on my back, she heard a sound like feet dragging along the concrete floor, like someone was floating in the air with toes of their shoes touching the floor. She said that the caretakers followed us the entire time, back onto the elevator and to the lobby. As we sat outside in the cold air, with the lobby in sight through the windows, I asked her if they were still there. She looked over her shoulder and said they were gone. We stopped dating soon after our little tour to the mineral wells. I don't think it was the ghost that had anything to do with it. It was probably the red rum comment. And here's a story I think you'll enjoy. This is read to us by Kendall in Humboldt, California. And Kendall's going to read something that was given to him by his friend Zach in Humboldt, California. Theater Ghosts, a true ghost story. Theater Ghosts, a true ghost story by Zach Rouse. I'm the technical director at an old vaudeville theater in Eureka, California, called the Arkley Center. Humboldt County, California is a magical place. When you drive up from the Bay Area or down from Oregon, there is a veil you cross to enter the area that people refer to as the Emerald Curtain. This curtain is a very powerful, energetic curtain that protects the people and the area from negative outside sources, forces. There's a physical as well as spiritual element to this veil. Coming in from the south, you're on Highway 101, and you cross the curtain at a very specific location, a town called Willits. Once you are north of Willits, time slows down and you lose your sense of direction. 
Driving from Willits to Eureka, you're in a time warp. You're in the middle of a redwood forest and driving parallel to the west coast for two hours. But it feels like days that you're winding up this endless road. From the north, you cross the threshold on Highway 199 at the border of California and Oregon. You drive toward the coast from the inland heat, and the blanket of trees goes from oaks and brush to redwoods, and the air transforms from hot and dry to the mystical coastal fog that keeps us safe and cool. The reason I describe this phenomenon to you is because Along with the obvious environmental bubble that we live in up here, there is also a spiritual bubble. Manifestation works faster in Humboldt County than anywhere else I've lived, and I've lived in many cities. Humboldt is a mystical vortex. If you want to see Jane today, all you have to do is think it. You won't have to wait long. You'll see Jane by noon. If you need to find a place to live, even though there is almost no housing inventory in the whole county, you'll always, somehow, seem to find the perfect place for you at that time. But beyond the mystical benefits to living in a place like Eureka Arcata, we have a substantial population of ghosts and time travelers. Frequently, you'll be driving down the street and you'll see a 50-something man in clothes that you're certain are from a turn-of-the-century gold mining town, which this was originally settled as. He'll be wearing an old felt or wool hat that's stained and tan-colored, a tan trench coat, burlap-looking pants, and work boots that are clearly not available at your local Target. In fact, there is nothing about the man, his long, wiry white beard, or his outfit, nor even his demeanor that indicates he is of this time. He's just passing through this spiritual supply depot on his way back to his claim in the hills. Now back to the theater where I work. Many old theaters are purported to have resident ghosts. I think of ghosts in two categories. The first is the energy eddy. Energy eddies are like when you see your dead cat walking down the hall in your house. That cat got under your feet daily for 15 years, walking the same route to the litter box multiple times a day. He left a visual and energetic echo in this plane when he took off to the next realm. And to this day, you still see his echo. You might even hear his meow off in the distance, but he's not really there. It's just the echo of his existence lingering in the world he left behind, and you get to enjoy that living memory of your little snowball. The second type of ghost is the sentient type. These are ghosts who have retained their egos, and for whatever reason, they maintain a living existence that is parallel to ours, but they are just on the other side of the veil, far enough away that we can't really interact with them except in fleeting moments. Well, at the theater that I work at, we have both types of ghosts. When I first started here, I asked the house manager who had been working here for 10 years, the off the cuff question, any resident ghosts? <laughs> when her face went pale, I knew I'd struck a chord. She then proceeded to tell me the story of something that had happened just a few weeks prior when she was alone in the building. She had been downstairs in the basement of the theater where we have our production office. She was organizing files. In that office and all the dressing rooms, there are TVs which act as monitor screens that have a feed of the stage deck. This is so that you can always know what's happening in the performance in case you need to make a cue or an entrance or whatever. As the house manager was organizing her files, she glanced over at the screen and she saw a very tall man in a top hat and trench coat crossing the stage. She was alone in the theater. No one else was present, and she was alone in the basement. In order for her to get out and away, she would have to go upstairs in the lobby and avoid the theater hall altogether. Needless to say, she got the hell out of there and did not turn off any lights. She also described to me her regular experience while working alone in the box office, 
hearing a group of children laughing and running up and down the lobby stairs, which are directly next to the office she's working in. She said that she'll be on the computer and she'll hear the patter of feet and the echo of children laughing as they go. She'll go into the hall and nothing. I assume they don't mind showing themselves to her because she's a mother of young children herself and they probably feel safe to play around her. But for me, I had no experiences for the first six months of my tenure at the theater. Having had ghost experiences in the past and believing the stories to be true, whenever I'm alone in the building, I always walk down the halls and try to take a sideways glance down the darkened hall or into empty rooms to try to detect a sign of something beyond the bounds of our reality. When I walk by the doors to the main theater, I always look into the theater out of the corner of my eye to see if I see anything, a shadow, a figure, any kind of movement. Sadly, I never catch a glimpse of the man in the top hat or catch wind of the kids in the hall until six weeks ago. We've been doing some upgrades to the sound and lighting systems in the theater recently. And we did a completely new lighting setup two months ago. Once complete, my co-TD and I were in the theater going through the lighting. I was on stage and he was at the console at the back of the house. He was going through each light and I was standing on stage so we could get a sense of where each light was focused. Each time he would illuminate a fixture, the stage would get very bright for a minute and then there would be total black darkness in between each light being lit up. I was standing upstage center, which is the middle of the stage, but farthest away from the audience, as he was going through the upstage sequence of lights. And at one point, it went dark on stage, and after the previous light had been on and then turned off, things got extremely dark on stage. My eyes couldn't adjust fast enough to see anything in the short moment of darkness before the next light went on. Out of instinct, I turned to my right in the darkness and about three feet to my right in the upstage right wing was our top hatted man. Standing six foot four or so, he was wearing a trench coat that went to his shins. My spine went completely tingly and I froze still in place. I couldn't move away or toward him. All I could do was stand there petrified. He was staring directly at me. Within two seconds, a red light came on and he was gone. But I felt his presence even though he was visually gone. We speculated that he may have been wearing a costume perhaps playing the role of Abraham Lincoln and waiting in the wings to go on stage for his performance. The crazy thing is, even though I saw him, I didn't see him. I saw a black shadow figure that had the shape of a tall man in a top hat and a trench coat. I somehow knew what he was wearing, his gender, his height, etc., without seeing him but he was there plain as day and he was looking right at me. I guess he got the message that I'd wanted to meet him and he found a pretty direct way to interact. From that point forward, I will always talk to him and any other beings we have in our theater, both greeting them when I arrive and saying goodbye when I leave at the end of the evening. I try to be respectful of their space and let them know when we'll be back all the noises, odd occurrences, the, uh, the automatic toilets flushing throughout the building when no one is here, they are just a part of a life in the theater. If your coffee goes missing or your prop, you just understand that even though you are alone in the building, you are never really alone, especially behind the redwood curtain. And that's it for Anything Ghost, number 249. Number 250 is up next. If you have a story you want to share, send it to lex at anythingghost.com. And don't forget those deadlines for the Anything Ghost Halloween special. It's a big one. 
think last year was a two to three hours, but it has been four hours in the past. But so be prepared for that. The deadlines again are October 13th. If I'm going to read your story, October 17th, if you narrate it yourself, read it yourself. And the release date will be either the 20th or the 21st around that. So make a note of it. All right, everybody. Thanks for all your stories. And don't forget about the VIP group. To get the complete access to the Anything Ghost VIP group, go to anythingghost.com. And then go to the Anything Ghost. Join 